teaching, and growing together through the Bible. This is Hope of Glory with Pastor Mark Barrett. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn in them to the book of Hebrews chapter 3 where we are making our way through this great book of the Bible. And uh, today we're in chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. When I drive down the road, probably like you, I am constantly looking at signs that warn me of things that I need to be uh, watching for, that I need to be careful about. And so sometimes I'll see a sign that gives me an indication of how fast I should be going maximum. You realize that's maximum, right? Not minimum. (laughs) <laughs> Some people take that as to be a minimum speed. <laughs> so uh, that's a warning on any particular point of the road that I can only go so fast because that's what they've deemed to be safe on that portion of the highway. I see on most roads lines down the middle of the road that show me that uh, I need to stay on my side of the highway or the road. And I see signs that are in a, in a triangle that sometimes say yield. And so sometimes it's yield to, to traffic, and sometimes it's yield to pedestrians. And so I see crosswalks with lights that flash every once in a while. All of these things are warnings. All of these things are ways that, uh, that they are trying to bring protection to those who are who are driving on the roads, and they try to keep society safe. In the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we find all kinds of warnings to us in the same way. Warning signs that are flashing in the heavens, as it were. Warning signs in Scripture that are intended to not only keep us safe, but keep us going in the right direction of life and that will ultimately lead us home to our Heavenly Father. God doesn't want to punish us, but He must punish sin. And because of that, He continually is warning us so that we'll make the right choices in life, so that we'll make the right decisions and the right turn and stop at the right time and yield at the right time and stay in the right path so that we will find our way home through salvation. In Hebrews chapter 3, we've been talking about the number of warnings that Hebrews has given to us. We've already seen one warning, the warning not to drift. Be careful of drifting. Here's another warning in Scripture that is to people on a sinful course, people on a sinful course to turn their hearts to turn their lives to Jesus. Before we get into the passage, I I have to stop and give you a little bit of a background to what's happening here. Remember that the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish people, and they were Jewish people who were going through difficult times. They were being persecuted because of their faith. They were losing their jobs. Uh, Families are, are moving away from them because they don't want to be associated. The Jews have, have, uh, have, have pretty much said, you're not a part of us. The Gentiles said, well, you're not following the Jewish law, so what are you? And they were, they were very much in an island. They were living on their own. They were very discouraged. Some of them believed the gospel and they were saved. Some of them believed the gospel, but they had not yet committed themselves to Jesus Christ. While a third group wasn't convinced at all, they were still searching and wondering. And so when we read the book of Hebrews, we have to remember that the book was written primarily to the believing Jews, but every once in a while, the author pauses and he talks to two other groups of people directed towards new Christians. That would be one group. Parts are directed toward those who believe but who haven't made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And the third per, uh, 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 group of people are those who don't believe at all. The passage we're looking at today is directed toward those who have heard the gospel. They received the gospel, but they haven't committed themselves to following Jesus Christ yet. And you know, I think there are an awful lot of people in our world like that. 
They've heard the gospel. They, they understand the gospel. There are people who believe the truth about Jesus Christ, but they simply have not committed themselves to him yet. And so you'd see just knowing about Christ isn't enough. Just believing that he is who he said he is, that's not enough. Uh, just, just accepting the truths about Jesus, that's not enough. That only leads to condemnation because you knew the truth, but you rejected the truth. And the verses we're looking at today are a warning to those who have heard the truth. Maybe they even believe the truth, maybe even accept the truth, but they have not committed themselves fully to the person of Jesus Christ. It's a bit like the man who is trapped in the top floor of his apartment building and the place is on fire. And the firemen are on the street below with their nets stretched out and they're yelling at the man at the top of their voices and they're saying, jump, jump, we'll save you. And the man, however, is so concerned about the possessions left behind that he turns and walks back into his apartment and he's consumed by the flames. And the passage we're looking at today is a voice of the Holy Spirit yelling to us, come unto me. Trust me. Put your hope in me. There is danger of hell's fire. Jump into the arms of a loving and kind Savior and he will save you. Now, in order to get, get the warning across, the author uses an Old Testament illustration because he's talking to Jews and, and they would know this story. They would know this story quite well. And since Moses was already the subject of verses 1 to 6, which we talked about last week, the author just picks up on the illustration of Moses and he uses that to try to issue this warning. You remember in verses 1 to 6 from last week, the author set about to prove that Jesus is greater than Moses. They, they couldn't imagine anyone being closer to God than Moses because Moses, he received the law, right? Moses spoke with God face to face. And so the Jews, they, 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 they took Moses to a higher level and he was the greatest. And, and the author comes along and he says, no, there's, there's somebody greater, somebody greater than everything and anything. Uh, we saw in chapter 1 that he's better, he's greater than the prophets. And we saw in chapter 2 that he is greater than the angels. And, and, and then we saw here in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, that, that he's greater than Moses because he's the mediator of a new and a, a better covenant. And since he's already talking about Moses in the chapter, he goes, well, I may as well carry on, on with that theme. And so he begins to talk about those who are hanging on the brink of decision, and he uses Moses and the wandering in the wilderness as, as an example of this. This passage falls into three, three points that I'm going to cover today. Well, first of all, we're going to see the illustration that he uses, <clears throat> and then we're going to see the invitation and then he moves to, to an instruction. Let's begin this morning by looking at the illustration. And I just want to read the passage for you, beginning in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, this is a passage that is actually taken from a psalm of David that was just read for you, Psalm 95. And in that psalm, what David said happened during the time of Moses is what he said was happening during the time when David wrote his psalm. That is happening in our day today. And so let's, let's think about the illustration of Israel in, in the wilderness. What happened then happened during the time of the Hebrews that is happening in our day. Remember that Israel had been in captivity in Egypt for 400 years. They had literally been working their bones to the nubs. They were literally working themselves to death, making brick and mortar for the Pharaoh's construction projects. 
And they begin to call out to God for rescue. Well, it had been prophesied that they would spend 400 years. The 400 years is up. God hears their call and he sends Moses. And through Moses, he sends plagues on the land in an effort to get Pharaoh to release the children of Israel. All these plagues come on the land. The final plague being that the firstborn of every Egyptian family would be taken in death. That was a significant thing. The heritage, the one who would inherit everything, the one who would be, be raised up to, to be the next leaders in, in that family. Pharaoh releases Israel and Moses, and Moses leads them out of Egypt and into the promised land. But as they were moving out, they encountered some problems. And the first big problem they encountered was what? The Red Sea. And they didn't have a boat <laughs> big enough for a million people. But that wasn't an issue for God. God just parted the waters, and they walked across on dry land. And then the Egyptian army came in behind and they thought they would pursue them through the waters and God closed the waters and the Egyptian army was destroyed. And then they got into the wilderness and immediately they didn't believe God would take care of their needs. God had just delivered them from Egypt. They had just witnessed the plagues. That did not affect them, by the way. He, he witnessed the, the taking of the firstborn, which God spared them with the blood on the, on, the, on the door mantles. The Passover, that's what we celebrate in the Passover. Or the Lord's table, if you will. That, that's what we celebrate, that he's a re redeemer, that he, that he rescued them. They had all these miracles. God had parted the sea. There was the cloud that led them during the day and the fire by night. He had done all these things. They saw God, and yet they did not believe in Him. And throughout their journey, they would complain, and they would grumble, and they would show their disbelief in God, and they ended up wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years when it should have taken them maybe a week to get there and into the land. And this becomes a picture for us as David issues the warning in Psalm 95, a thousand years, by the way, before Hebrews was written, to the people of his day. And now the writer of Hebrews is telling the people living in his day the very same thing. <laughs> Things don't change very much through history, do they? And I, can, and I can stand here today and tell you that the same thing David said was happening in his day and Hebrew said was happening in his day, which is don't do today what the Hebrews told the Hebrews not to do because David told the Hebrews not to do it because Moses said they did it. Did you follow that? So let's begin with verse 7, which is really quoting Psalm 95. And he says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice. By the way, verses 7 to 11 is really a parenthesis in the passage. And you could really jump from verse 7 right down to verse 12, and it would make a whole lot of sense. Where it would say, today, if you hear his voice, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. See, it makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? So it's just a parenthesis in the passage, but he continues the parenthesis in verse 8 by saying, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. The word harden is used, by the way, no less than five times in this short little passage. It's used in verse 8, it's used in verse 13, it's used in verse 15, and again it's used over in chapter 4 and verse 7. It's, a, it's an important word, it's a word of urgency. When you hear a word repeated in Scripture time and again like that, you need to pay attention. It's a word of urgency. It's something that God says, you need to listen to this. And in all those verses, I want you to notice that he uses the word today. Today. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean 24 hours, but, but it's talking about the day of grace. It, it may mean less than 24 hours. It, it might mean right now. It may mean this very moment. In other words, if you know the truth of Jesus Christ, 
If you know the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says, don't do what Israel did in the wilderness. They knew God's truth. They saw God's revelation. They saw his miracles, but they hardened their hearts. And he says, today, if you hear the gospel, if you hear the good news, don't harden your heart like they did. The great evangelist D.L. Moody was preaching in Chicago at a great crusade, and at the end of the crusade, in presenting the gospel, he says, now I want you to think about what I said as you go home tonight. And when you come back tomorrow evening, I want you to make a decision. Well, that night, the great Chicago fire happened, and half of his congregation were killed in the fire. And Moody said, that's the last time I ever told anybody to go anywhere and think about it. You see, the Word says, now is the day of salvation. Salvation is a now thing, because you might not have tomorrow. And he goes on to say in verse 7, if you hear His voice. Well, that's important. Hearing is a matter of the will. It's a choice. A person has a choice to harden their heart and not listen to the truth or open their heart. It's a matter of personal action. It's a choice and it's an action. Maybe you've had the experience of ironing something. And maybe you had the iron too hot or you left it on there too long. And what happens to that piece of clothing? Is we, we say it sears the clothing, right? It it's leaves a, a mark on there. I did that one time and it wasn't my clothes. It was a problem, right? I, I seared the clothes I was ironing. What does that mean? It, what does that mean in a spiritual sense? That, that can happen to the heart. can happen to the heart spiritually. I find that back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, Now the Spirit expressly, expressly says that in latter times, Some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared. What does it mean to have a seared conscience? How does this conscience get seared? Well, by it it gets seared by hearing something over and over and over. It's left on the clothes too long, right? It's, you, you hear it over and over and over again, and, and every time you hear it, you, you, you turn your back on it. You say no to it, and, and, and the next time you turn, turn your back, and you say no to it, and after a while, the conscience becomes seared in, in, in that you have no sensitivity to it anymore. Maybe you've had the experience of maybe, uh, um, I don't know, falling down and, and skinning yourself so badly that 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 piece of skin now has no feeling to it. Maybe some of you have had that. Um, and, and, that's, and that's that's how it is to sear the conscience. There's, there's no sensitivity to it anymore. There's no feeling anymore. And so now when you hear the gospel, well, it, it just doesn't even affect you anymore. You have no sensitivity towards it. And so today is important. The word today is important. Why? Because today only lasts so long and eventually your conscience becomes insensitive to the Spirit's calling and then tomorrow comes and it's too late. Today only lasts as long as your conscience is sensitive to the Spirit of God. I want you to notice in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 3 how he picks up on this specific illustration. And he says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Those are all important words because they're actually pointing us back to the book of Exodus in chapter 17, where Israel was wandering in the wilderness. And as they journeyed around in the wilderness, they ran short of water on a couple of occasions. But on this occasion... Uh, They ran short of water and they started grumbling against Moses and 
And Moses becomes, you know, irritated, upset. He goes to God and he goes, God, why are you letting me lead this rebellious bunch of people? I've had it up to here with them. And he was really quite upset about the whole thing, as he should have been. And, and, and Moses said to them in verse 2, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? In, in other words, in other words, why are you tempting God? What are you tempting Him for? God has been providing for you all along. You've seen the miracles. You've seen the cloud. You've seen the fire. You've seen the parting of the Red Sea. Why are you testing God again? And so, verse 6 of 17 of Exodus, God, God tells Moses to go and strike a rock, and water would come out. And so Moses goes over and strikes the rock, and and water comes out. And in verse 7, he named that place, and we read that in Psalm 95, he named that place Massa and Meribah. Massa means tested, and Meribah means striving. And so he gives it that name because Israel tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Think about that. That was the dumbest absolute stupidest thing they could have ever said that was just ridiculous how could they how could they not know that god was with them after all that he had done for them already but you see that's the nature of unbelief it, it never has enough proof it just keeps asking for more but listen, you don't, you don't need more proof that God is with you, whether his God is real or not. You need to come to your pla a place in your life where you hate your sin enough to commit yourself to knowing the truth. And as long as you keep putting God to the test, you'll never know the truth and your conscience will become seared and someday you won't even know it anymore. Back to Hebrews 3, he says, don't do that. Don't do what Israel said. Don't do what they did in the, in the wilderness by hardening their hearts. Don't always be testing God. Don't be the person who hangs around all these things and all these years and you've seen what God has done, but you've never committed your life to Him. You don't need more evidence but you're just not willing to commit yourself to Jesus Christ. He closes the illustration in Israel in the wilderness in verse 11 by saying, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now that word rest is, a, is an important word. It's referring to the promised land. In context, it's referring to the promised land in Canaan. But it implies rest from wandering and toil. But Israel continued in their sin, and they continued to disbelieve, disbelieve. And so what happens? An entire generation, an entire generation perishes, all but two, in the wilderness because of their unbelief. unbelief. The patience of God simply was exhausted. And the sad thing is that even the generation that did enter into the land never knew complete rest from their toil. Remember that God told them to go in and, and to wipe out the nations. And, and he told them about the Canaanites. And that they needed to go in and wipe out the Canaanites because they were a godless, unbelieving people. And God was going to use Israel as a tool to bring judgment on Canaan. The Canaanites were so pagan that they buried live babies in jars in the walls of every building in their house. They were such a gross, immoral, and godless people that God's justice had come into play. But instead of destroying them, Israel began intermarrying with them. They began worshiping their gods. And as a result, they never knew the fullness of the rest that God had for them. And ultimately, Israel was scattered all over the world. When Jesus comes to set up his kingdom, there will finally be rest. But until that day comes, there's no rest. And so there's the illustration and how God treats those who know the truth 
but they harden their hearts and they, they keep saying, give me more proof. The real problem is that they love their sin too much to turn their lives over to him. Now, on the basis of, of the illustration, I want you to see the invitation. Verse 12. He says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in you, in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Now, having taken an illustration from thousands of years ago, now he's asking them to consider their own heart. And I believe he's asking us to consider our own hearts today as well. You see, this is a warning against reject, rejecting the knowledge of the truth. The judgment in the wilderness days was that those who rejected God's word through Moses perished. And the warning here in verse 12 is on those who have rejected the word of Jesus Christ and will perish. Notice that he says, take care Brothers. Now, we've talked about that word brothers. Earlier on, he uses another word with that, identifying who they were. He says, holy brothers, meaning people who have been redeemed, people who have been saved. But here he only uses the word brothers, which is a word that is used throughout the book of Acts. And he's, and he's talking generally about the Jewish population, specifically about those who have not received Christ have not committed themselves to him. Because maybe they like Jesus, but they also like their sin. And they don't like persecution, and so they're not making a decision. And as a result, he says that they have a heart of what? Of unbelief. Now here are a bunch of people who are on the verge of faith. They're on the verge. They're just standing at the edge. Maybe some of them even have professed to be Christians. And they've never, however, admitted to being aggressively against Christ, but they are. You see, no matter how close you are to Christ, no matter how close you come to Jesus, if you never commit fully to Him, you have a heart of unbelief. Once you've received the revelation of Jesus Christ and have understood the gospel and you've said no to Jesus, you've turned your back on Him, you'll begin moving backwards. You'll move farther away from Jesus until finally your heart is hardened and it's seared and he won't have any effect on you at all. And so if, you'll, if you're still sensitive to him, respond today. Today is the day of salvation. We've, we follow up by the instruction in verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He's literally saying, I want you to come alongside one another, and I want you to urge one another to receive Christ. Plead with one another to accept Christ. The word deceitfulness means trickery or scheming. Sin is so tricky, isn't it? Sin never makes itself out to look like what it really is. Someone said that the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. And when we present the Son of God, if He doesn't melt your heart of faith, then He can harden your heart to unbelief if you're not willing to respond to Him. You see, sin tells you that it's really not as bad as what you think it is. Sin says that you don't really need Christianity because Christianity is just going to keep you from doing the things you want to do. It's going to keep you from enjoying life. It's, it's going to keep you from doing the things that you like to do, and that's the biggest lie that sin can tell you because sin is deceitful. And so the Bible says, exhort one another in the faith. Exhort one another to receive Christ. Verse 14 goes on to say, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Now some people are, are saying, now, now wait a minute, I believe all this God stuff. Like, I believe the Messiah. I believe, 
that he was a great guy. I, I believe that. But Hebrews says that if you really believe it, and if you've really committed your life to it, the evidence will be that when it's all over, you're still going to be there. The greatest proof that somebody is really a believer is that they continue in the gospel. Did you notice in verse 15, it, 14, if we indeed hold our original confidence in him firm when? To the end. To the end. And that's why he repeats the command in verse 15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in, as in the rebellion. He wants us to get this so badly that he repeats it twice in the passage. You see, if God judged unbelief in the wilderness, he's going to judge unbelief in the same way today. Entire generation rejected God. And they all died in the wilderness as a consequence of their sin. And so he ends with the crux of the illustration by saying in verse 19, And so we see, they were unable to enter because of unbelief. One of the saddest verses in all the Bible. In verse 18 he says, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter to his rest? But to those who were what? Disobedient. They couldn't enter the land because of unbelief and disobedience. God, you know, God wants to pour his blessings out upon us today and for an eternity. And it just requires one thing. One thing. Faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In closing, I want you to hear what, uh, what uh, Solomon said in his proverb in chapter 29 and verse 1. Listen to what Solomon writes. He who is often reproved, yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be broken beyond healing. Wow. That's a scary reproof. To be broken beyond healing. That, that's what it means to harden your heart against God. It, it's basically to invite God's judgment on your life. It, it's, it can get to a point where where you just you're beyond you're beyond healing, and and God just withdraws withdraws His hand, and so I would plead with you today, as the Hebrew says that we ought to plead with one another. If you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit today, and you've never trusted Him as your Savior, please please respond to Him, accept Him before it's too late. And you can do that as we pray this morning. Lord Jesus, we've listened to this passage that gives us a strong reproof. It's a strong warning sign shouted out from the heavens through the prophets, through the ages, through examples in Scripture, not to harden our hearts, but to receive you to put our faith in you. And if there's somebody today in the, this, this sanctuary or somebody online that you've never received Christ, you can do so right now and you can say something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe, but I not only believe, but I want to put my faith and my trust totally in you, Jesus. I'm responding to you, asking you to come into my life and save me from my sin and help me to walk in obedience to your word, by your spirit and through your strength. Lord, I can't be saved on my own and I can't keep myself saved, but I'm trusting in you fully and alone to save me, to redeem me. Come into my heart. If you said a prayer like that this morning, I'd, I'd invite you to let me know so that I can encourage you. Lord, just help us to walk in your grace and in your power day by day. Thank you that you did come to redeem us. Thank you for Jesus who died on the Calvary's cross to pay the penalty for our sins.
Thank you that when we put our trust in him, that he gives us everlasting life. And that you walk through this life and through the storms of life with us, giving us strength in our everyday trials. Thank you that you are a great God. Thank you for allowing us to have a relationship with you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining our broadcast today of Hope of Glory, presented by North Broadway Baptist Church in Tilsonburg. If you have any prayer requests or would like to get in contact with us, you can email us at northbroadwaychurch at gmail.com or give us a call at 519-688-5959. To find out more information about us, you can check out our website at northbroadwaychurch.ca or check out our Facebook page. To keep up to date on past episodes of Hope of Glory, you can also find us on YouTube at North Broadway Baptist Church, Tilsonburg. From all the staff and members, thank you. And we'll see you again next week.